Well, it has been quite a morning already, and I just heard that uh, Fremont had 13 baptisms last hour. There you go. It's amazing. So close to close to 40 throughout our campuses, and and uh, it's just been a lot of fun. We've been talking about hope for a while, and we've been looking at this little book called First Peter, and Peter said right when we got started that there's this living hope. It's not wishful thinking kind of stuff. It's, 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 it's better than that. It's, it's being assured, right, of a future. And so Pete's been walking us through this for the last several weekends, and I'm going to do my very best to be blunt or maybe just kind of clear. I've never been accused of being deep. Um, that, that's because I'm clear. If I, if, if I wasn't clear, you'd go, oh, he's very deep. I don't know what he said, but he's very deep, right? Uh, so I, I want to do my very best to be extremely clear today. And I do think that a lot of us are living without hope. And it's one of the reasons why is because we haven't been able to forgive ourselves. And we're pretty sure that God hasn't done that either. And we're living with this stuff in our life, and we're trying to get rid of it. We're not sure exactly how to do it. We're trying to cope with some stuff as a result of some of the decisions we've made. And we often try as wrong, in fact, destructive ways of coping with our sin. And sometimes it's just a lot of, lot of, lot of working. You know, I'm going to stay busy. Maybe it's a little bit of too much drinking so I can fall asleep at night. Maybe it's just a kind of, ah, whatever, I'm just going to live my life and do whatever I want. But, it's, but, it's, but we realize then we're in this hopeless situation. We can't find our way out. So today we're going to take a look at, again, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 is where we're picking it up. And this is an amazing picture of Jesus. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. That's his purpose, right? He suffered physical death, but... He was raised to life in the Spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from the drowning of that terrible flood. Peter uses the illustration of Noah. Noah was told by God to build this big boat. It was massive. And by the way, the future of the world depends on the boat building skills of Noah. What? What? We're putting our hope on that dude, right? I don't know if he's ever cut a board before. I don't know if he's ever... Is he a carpenter? Does he know how to sail the thing? I don't know, right? So the hope of the world lays within the home and the family of the carpentry skills of Noah. What? Let's take a look at his life here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I'm going to wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing. All the people, animals, little small animals, will scurry along the ground, even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. Horrible place to be gets better. But Noah, Noah found favor with the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at that time. And he walked in a close relationship with God. I think one of the most important verses in the entire Bible is verse 8. But Noah, right? If, it wasn't, if we didn't have that verse in there, if Noah wasn't walking on the planet, if Noah wasn't around, here we go. But Noah found favor. Whoa, but found favor in the eyes of God, and he walked blamelessly. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. God says, build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Construct decks and stalls throughout the interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, upper. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every animal, male and female, into the boat. Keep them alive during the flood. 
Pairs of every kind of bird, every animal, every kind of small animal that scurries around the ground will come to you to be kept alive. Be sure to take on board enough food. Oh, yeah. Because, <laughs> like, have you ever gone somewhere and you forgot the food? Be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him, which I think is also super important, right? That's an amazing verse. God, Noah did exactly everything exactly as God had commanded. What if Noah had decided to take matters into his own hands? 450 seems long. I'm think I don't know what, um, gosh, uh, I was kind of thinking a cabin cruiser. I don't know why we need this 450-foot boat. Or why do we have to have three decks? This isn't the love boat. Why, you know, like, what are we doing here? Uh, why do I have to put a door? I want to put a door. I'll just do it. I'll do whatever. I, I'll make a boat however I want, right? It's kind of like you and me. When the guy says, here's kind of a design for your, here's the design for your life. And you go, hmm, I don't know. Uh, I was kind of thinking... I got, I got some ideas. I got some ideas. I'm so glad that Noah doesn't take matters into his own hands. Fascinating little verse here is that God says, look, I'm about to cover the earth. I'm about to. That kind of implies better start building now because I'm about to do something. But it takes him 50 to 75 years to build the boat. It's a long time, right? And every day he goes out and he does a little bit more, a little bit more, and gets his, his kids to work with him. And, and, and they're trying to put this thing together. They got to go get the wood, got to cut the wood, get some tar some, from somewhere and get this done. And every single day, every single day, somebody like, what a, what, that Noah, what a fool. What a complete, complete fool. Hey, Noah, how's the boat building? Fine, Jacob. Looking good. How long you been doing that? Three years. Ooh, better hurry up. Heard it's going to rain. Ten years later, 15 years, 20 years later, every single day is a little bit of a sermon Hey, God has said he is going to send the rain. I don't see no cloud. I think I'm fine. A bunch of animals kind of start marching into the, into the area. They're like, mm. Mm. I think I'm okay. He ain't going to do that. Why would he destroy And a door closes and some raindrops start falling. At that moment, right? At that moment, it's hopeless for anybody outside, outside the boat. Outside the boat, they can't get in. They can't, they're knocking, they're screaming, let us in. Hey, I'm so sorry I made fun of you for the last 50 years. I'm so sorry. Would 10,000 bucks help? Would that be okay? Let me give you my, let me give you my, how? So let me, whatever you need, I will give you, what, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, sorry. Let, please let us in. I promise, I promise, I promise, I won't, I promise. Now many of you know that feeling, hopelessness. Inside the boat is what? It's hope. There's hope there. And even though things might get pretty rough on the outside, because you're inside, you're alive and you have hope. A lot of us have been spiritually hopeless for a long time. We may not even be much church people, but we kind of we kind of get it, right? We we live with some shame, maybe some regret. And we try to suppress it a little bit. We think that God, and like, and we've been to those funerals, right? You've been to a funeral where somebody says, well, he's in a better place. In a place. And you go, well, if that's true, then I'm okay. Because I'm better than that dude. I'm okay. But that's not how it works. It's not about being better than. It's not about... It's not about, in fact, it's not even about going to church. It's not about praying. It's not about uh, serving. It's not about giving money. 
We're not earning points today because I'm here, right? Oh, cool, I'm racking up some points. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there. I'm going to get there. Uh, just a few more points, a few more little things, to diamonds to chew on, right? Went to church, cool. Uh, gave some money even. All right. Um, volunteered at the, went to the women's retreat, go to a small group, um, pray before meals. I think I'm going to get there. But there's not enough goodness in me to get me into heaven. I don't get there by my goodness. Now, compared to some other folks, I, like I'm doing pretty good, but compared to some others, and, and really the only comparison that really is valid is compared to Jesus, right? And we just read in 1 Peter that he never sinned. That's, that's it, right? I, ah, I can't even, can you imagine? A, I can't even imagine not sinning. I'd like to try, you know, like get better at it, but like, but there's, like, what, why am I still? And here's Jesus without sin. My goodness. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, we keep reading in this little passage here where he compares the water of baptism to what happened with Noah. And the water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by the removal of dirt from the body, but the response to God from a clean conscience it is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter makes this connection, just like Noah came through the water and was saved, so coming out of the water of baptism does that as well. And it's not a physical thing. It's not like a bath, like cleaning my outside stuff. And by the way, many of you are trying to clean your outsides. It's not about that. I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop. In Christ, we are a brand new creation. So what do we do? I mean, where does hope come from? Well, in the book of Acts, we read a, a, a sermon that Peter gives, right? The same guy who wrote this little book. He gives this amazing sermon. He comes to the end of the sermon. He says, this Jesus whom you crucified. So he's talking to the Jews there in Jerusalem. Whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ. And I kind of get this picture where he just kind of pauses. And somebody goes, what do we do about that? What do we do? Because there's this huge crowd. And so here's what he tells them in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized. That word repent just simply means to turn around, and it's way more than just feeling sorry, right? Like that, there's an element of feeling sorry for our sin, right? But you kind of know the drill. Sometimes, like like when your kids do something, like they they punch their sibling, and you say to them, you say, "What do you say? What do you say?" Sorry, right? They're not sorry. They're sorry they got caught. Or, right, it's like, I was telling you sorry. I'm like, I'm, uh, but I'm not, right? But you need to say this or you will, it will be even worse for you. Sorry. <laughs> so sometimes we say that to God. Sorry. <laughs> not. I'm supposed to say I'm sorry. So repentance is way more than just feeling sorry. It is a commitment to turn my life over to God. Let him be the Lord of my life. Instead of me being the boss, he's the boss. So repentance is letting him be the boss. And this is to be baptized. And what happens was that after Pete preaches this sermon, 3,000 people are baptized that. 3,000 people are baptized that day. That's crazy, right? Now, occasionally people will ask me, um, do I have to get baptized to be saved? Do I need to repent in order to be saved? 
And I listened to Francis, Francis Chan uh, speak on this, and he said that I always, when somebody asks me that, I always say, why do you ask? Why are you asking that question? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have to do that or not. I don't think anybody in that crowd that day go, do I have to do this? Because um, I think I'm okay. After all, I'm not a bad person. I think I'm okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch up with you later. I think they went, uh, okay. And just like Noah did everything that was commanded of him, you and I, we, we can argue with God about this. We can say, I don't think I have to. I already kind of... Uh, you know, my mom and dad got me baptized when I was a baby, but I don't know, is this something I'm supposed to do? I don't feel like I should or have to or probably, um, I, I don't know. Um, and we're going out to lunch afterwards. I saw a few folks walking out today. They're really wet, like their hair. We will dunk you. In fact, that's what the word baptism means, is to dunk or to plunge or submerge like a dish that's in the dish, like I'm putting it in the baptistry, cleaning it up. Huh. Do I have to do that? Like in front of God and everybody? Well, it's kind of up to you. Do you want to get in the boat or not? Do you want to get in or not? It, the key to this is being in Christ. How do I get, how do I do that? I, I submit. I turn my life over to, I, like, whatever you want. I, I want to be in. I want to be in. So I have to repent of my sins, turn my life over to God. All right. Pete was telling them to get in the boat that day. And then he says, well, this is a, is a pledge of a good conscience to God. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? You wanna, would you like a clean conscience? I don't want to stand in front of him with a guilty one. And I don't know how it plays out. But if I can have a clean conscience when I stand before God, all right. All right. This is an agreement, kind of like a contract. You're agreeing with the terms of the agreement, and God comes to me with the agreement. Here, Mark, I here's what I, I want to do for you. Would you like that? Now, I can come to God with some agreements, like, hey, God, I will go to church if you... Anybody ever played that one? God, I'll, I'll start going to church if you um, get me a new job with, with benefits. Um. You heal me of my cancer, I'll go to church. You get me a better boyfriend, I'm in. Right? You help me, I'll do whatever, right? Now, God is not obligated. He might, but he is not obligated. When I come to God with my terms, he's like, mm, I, think you, I think what you need to know is that I'm God. I'm God. And you are not, so you coming to me with your demands, kind of silly, but all right, I will take a look. But he is not obligated whatsoever. Now, by the way, if he does do some stuff, you better go to church. <laughs> but when God comes to me and says, Mark, here's the deal. You got a boatload of sin. And I will wipe that off. I will wipe that out as if it never happened. And I will take you to heaven. And I will give you a church here on the planet. And I will be with you always. I will do these things for you if you want to do it. And I, golly, that sounds too good to be true, right? You ever said that? That sounds too good to be true. Yes, that's why it's called amazing grace. 
It's not sort of kind of grace. It's amazing. It's mind-blowing, ridiculous kind of stuff when he says, I will do this for you. And I said, okay. He says, if you would just repent and be baptized, we could get the deal done today. So I'm asking you, would you like to have hope, not wishful thinking, but blessed assurance that Jesus is mine? Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. You want a taste of heaven today? You're going to get a picture of that right here, right now. Now, before you give me excuses, because in a little bit, we're going to have a time where you can come forward to be baptized. And we haven't done this very often. In fact, uh, it was three years ago. Now, we've had lots of people get baptized. Over 100 people have been baptized this, this year at Stonebridge. But typically, it's just like it, it, it's not on a Sunday morning in which we invite people to come forward. But we really felt like this was kind of leading us up to this moment in time where I think people, are, are, need, people need hope. So before you say, well, because already some of you are like, mm -mm. in fact, I've watched this all morning. Well, I didn't bring a change of clothes. Ha, that's weird because we brought some. <laughs> we got shorts and pants and shirts and towels. Well, um, my family's not here. <laughs> that's weird. We're, we're going to record this. And we'll send it to them today. I know you'd like them to be with you, but um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. And you might be coming up with some excuses right now. But for some of you, you've been listening to messages like this for a long time. 20, 30, 40, 50 years watching the boat being built, believing it's not going to rain. And I don't know why you wouldn't want to get in today. So in a little bit, uh, in fact, uh, right after this, I'm, we're going to have a time of communion. So it's about four or five minutes for you to process through some stuff at each of our campuses. Your campus pastor is going to come up and talk you through this. And uh, we're going to have a time of communion together, and then after that, I will come up and I'll give a little bit more instructions on what happens next. And um, so, you, so you just, just be praying about that, and let's decide. Okay, let's pray.